Golden good morning. Um, wonderful breakfast, Easter bunnies, hot cross buns, little Easter eggs, and Tom. We love to have you here again, Tom. And we're Thank gonna you. we're gonna uh, look forward to what you can tell us about not just the planets that we show here at the moment in our show, in the back and in the front, but also about your whole practice, what is the concept behind it, and to get... Gist. Gist! Gist. That's it, I'm over to you, and there will be questions and answers afterwards, as we usually have, so... <coughs> well, thank you. Oh, right. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, <laughs> thanks for uh, listening to my little talk. There's something a bit naive about uh, attempting to paint the planets. But there has to be, because it's such a big topic. It's such a, it's such a difficult thing to do, given the history of the idea of planets through all the different fields that people work in, music and science and all sorts of art. Um, so I had, to, uh, I had to adopt a kind of a slightly naive approach and see it um, as mostly, I guess you could call it a kind of a technical approach. Um, when I first started thinking of the idea, um, I was trying to offer a kind of fiction in art about planets. But I was trying to do that in relation to other great fictions in, in uh, various countries, such as science, science fiction. Um, but also science is a fact, because fact is very close to fiction in science. So I wanted to sort of say, well, art can make that kind of thing as well. So that was my motivation. Um, there are deeper questions in that. And there is a history, a personal history for me in that, but um, the main thing was this, this sort of quasi-technical approach. And I set about finding out about planets um, through documentation, photographs, and various scientific studies of planets and how they all worked. And one, of the, one of the first things that struck me was that there was, there was a sort of doubt about the idea that Pluto was a planet, and while I was doing this project it was realised the planet that Pluto was not actually shaped, it wasn't circular, it was spherical, and so it lost its planet status during the process of making these paintings. Um, my approach was uh, really to look at um, primarily the direct sensory experience of the planets on the Earth and to say, well, what, it is, what, what do we see as flesh and blood from the Earth? And then I tentatively went into sort of mediated versions telescopic visions of planets and so on. But I wanted to avoid the scientific interest. I wanted to avoid the construction of a fiction that science had already done with its false colour systems for showing features of planets. Uh, and many of those false colour images of planets have actually become, in the popular imagination, what the planets actually look like. So I had to do a fair bit of digging around to find what might be seen if you were near these planets. And I came up with a few uh, sources in, in the Sydney Library and so on. So the colours that you see are pretty much um, uh, what I found from those sources, for photographic sources. Of course, um, the, the shapes are also uh, direct physical, uh, as close as I can get to direct physical experience of the planets, um, because uh, you, a lot of the curves you can see in the paintings, which you can see here, are actually what are traceable. Uh, from the paths of planets uh, on the Earth. So if you were careful enough in your observations, you can see that planets move in these sort of strange, jerky ways. Some of them are slightly more elaborated than others, and some are actually compound uh, shapes as well. And so that was the basic technical material that I used. Um, I then used uh, certain, there were certain techniques that I wanted to use from 20th century painting, which my main interest. So uh, the idea of flat and great, great gradated colour is very important in my work as well. So the, the idea of, um, from the 19th century of simultaneous colour, colour contrast, which then uh, Delaunay tries to develop in his work, is influential on my way of understanding how um, colour works and how shapes work in a painting. Okay, so those are the technical things, and you can see that I'm starting to go into theoretical ideas about um, how the technical things work. But one of the other things I'm very interested in is the orientation of the viewer to the painting and how that can be reconfigured as well. And when I was doing research on this, one of the things that really struck me what, from the point of view of a satellite is the way that when you look at the, at the Earth from the satellite's path, it actually looks like a big wall. Not so much like down there or up there, but in fact in front of you like a wall. 
Now, the effect is compound in the sense that you're looking down, you know you're looking down intellectually, but you also know you're looking sideways. So your capacity to find a fixed orientation is completely gone once you're outside of the gravitational system of the Earth. And what I wanted to do with the planets was actually to somehow find a way to express that in painting. And so what I did was I tried to make the um, work seem both a view from outside the planet as well as from inside. So these, these views are actually, the image that you see in the painting is meant to be seen as if it were stand, looking up from inside the planet as well as looking out. And the painting behind me, I think that, the, this, for instance, the sun, which uh, you sort of get around the difficulty of the surface, um, is actually a view both from within inside, with inside the sun and from outside. And essentially the only way you can do that with the sun is through a black hole, it's through one of the uh, sunspots, not the black hole. So the idea is this is actually a kind of a double image of the picture of a sunspot. Now, these are not um, representation, representational paintings, of course. Um, so there is, a, there is a sort of double image there too, in that the paintings are both uh, a flat surface, which actually is, as I see it, the, the fiction of the painting, but also somehow alludes to uh, the planet as well. So both planet, the, the, so in other words, the rectangle effectively is the planet, as well as there being allusion to the actual shape of the planet. Now, um, that's pretty much summarises my approach. But um, um, there are the, the sort of I want to go back to the naivety of actually choosing a, a, a topic like this because um, choosing planets is one of the great mysteries of um, human existence. It's one of the great none of us will will ever go to planets and it's doubtful that the uh, population of the Earth actually has the wealth to, to focus the energy that needs to be focused in order to get one of us beyond Mars, probably. I mean, this, this planet doesn't have enough resources to do that. So it's unlikely in the, in the future that we can imagine, in the next few thousand years perhaps, that we're likely to get beyond probably Mars. We might send probes to Jupiter and so on, but physically to be present before these planets is almost is, is going to be impossible. And yet, this idea fills our imagination. So what the planets as an idea represent is something profoundly um, mysterious for human existence. So it reflects the capacity or the... the one of, it's one of the things that reflects the, the, the great mystery of what it is to be a person. Now, for me, that's one of the great things that paintings can do. Um, paintings, for me, uh, reflect the great mystery of the person. It's the thing that's discovered in the Renaissance is that the person is a great mystery. And it's elevated, this mystery is elevated in people's thinking. And it appears in all the arts and all the sciences, this idea of what it is to be a person. And we are still finding it out. We're still, we have this urge as humans, I think, to find that mystery. And after having made the paintings, that's, I realised that after I'd made them. And, um, and I think that uh, the urge was, in a sense, unconscious in the work. So I felt probably an unconscious need to actually make these works. And so that's why I had to remain a little... I had to remain unconscious in order to keep my head steady on the, on the way that the, the, uh, the paintings were actually worked out. So, thank you. That's <laughs> questions. And this, one of the questions that I thought would be... Um, where does this idea come from me personally? I mentioned earlier that there's a personal history. When I was at art school in the 80s, one of the first things that the painting teacher asked us, asked us to do was to um, consider images for painting of the seven deadly sins. And at the time I can remember thinking, this is terribly corny. <laughs> and I sort of laughed and I thought, you know, we're all, we're all just sort of you know, reproducing images from... Uh, yeah, what's expected of us. In other words, we were being introduced to sort of sanctioned ideas in art. And, and, uh, but after a while I realised that um, actually to, to, to make art is to, to try and find some new way to see seeing sanctioned ideas, to desanction them. And so the, the business of making art under these sort of uh, collected ideas is actually to offer a new, a new idea within the sanctioning and to somehow elude it. And, uh, and that, started, that actually set me on the path to thinking something very important about art is to whom does it, is it addressed? And uh, one of the things that I think art is addressed to in this mystery of the person 
is that it's addressed to parts of the person, but not all of the person. So um, in everyone's lives, we sort of gather ourselves, we kind of ignore certain things about ourselves in order to satisfy the various things that are expected of us, and we become a civilised person, we hope, more or less. <laughs> so, um, and I think that art addresses that part of us that sort of somehow is um, kind of not always given its just position in the world. And so there is something about the mystery of a person which is about justice for the individual, uh, justice for the flesh that's revealed in art. It's not actually revealed in the work itself, but in the actual effect of it. It's, an, it's not therapeutic, it's actually an undoing of the civilised self. So all art, I think, undoes the civilisation process. And, and that, uh, that, has, that has led me to the idea that art might be, um, or when I'm trying to figure out what art is, you know, I often say that it's the enemy of culture. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, and I, I'm, I still, and the more I go on with this whole business of making art, the, the, the process of making culture is also the process of destroying it. And anything that aspires to greatness in art does both. I think it both destroys and creates at the same time. So, um, you said something about the curves okay. having a relationship to the trajectories of yeah. the planets. There. Are these actually, um, is there a mathematics in this? No, there's just an intuition. All I did was find the paths as they were mapped out in the books that showed these paths and just sort of made curves that were actually the shapes. The entire part, there's nothing mathematical about these except for the measuring of the canvas, which is too so old. It could almost be done like, you know, on a computer. Yeah, could they? They do yeah. have a sort of digital yeah. um, consistency. Yeah. Or... With these, I thought it was very important to make them by hand. I wanted mm. to, to make sure that they were, they were intuitive. And, and so, you know, to get away from the mediation that the machine yeah. All the, the complex machinery of culture does, but actually to find something tactile in them. And I know that sounds a little bit sort of, you know, primal, like some sort of weird seeking for something primal, but I still feel very strongly about physically making work, even though I do make that with ephemeral works and videos and things. I think that, I don't think that if video work is actually ephemeral at all, that it actually consists of objects that are actually made. That, um, and I'm I believe still very strongly in objects, and, you know, not within the work, but that an art must be an object that has a physical presence. It's just that uh, I think that there are lots of ways that humanity has attempted to escape the limitations of natural existence and necessity in nature, and the idea that images are ephemeral through the internet is actually one of those. And I know there are many famous art historians who follow that one, but I'm not sure about it. I don't necessarily agree with it. Are the scales of the canvases relate to the scale, the size relationships of the plants? No, they're related to the um, viewing of a person. So they're related to groups of people, the way that a person can approach a painting. The idea that they, they have to be big in order that when you're close to them like I am, you can look at parts of them without seeing the edges. Immersive. Yeah, yeah, so there is a point at which the immersion takes place and they're just big enough to do that. If they're any bigger, they, they would probably work as well. But there is a point at which where the physical presence of the person approaches the painting and they go from being sort of like that to mm. being in space. Mm. But there is a variation. Yeah, slight also. variation. Some of them are slightly narrower. I yeah. think these are all the same size, but the, um, a couple of them are slightly narrower and that's because I was experimenting with the proportion of the canvas. Mm -hmm. Because uh, a square, as I, I tend to like square canvases, but as you go up in canvases, a uh, square starts to look too narrow. Is that in relation to its yeah, height? Yeah, so yeah. that's why that's slightly wider. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is, again, it, I, I, that kind of idea comes from my architectural training, which is to do with entarsis in Greek uh, architecture. And all the mm -hmm. columns are slightly bulged in order yeah. that they look straight, and all the columns taper in order that they look vertical. Mm. So. I have another question uh, that uh, Tony Wong and, uh, and, and Graham asked the other day when they were here. Um, there is a lot of movement there, and it is oil. We mm. know oil can take the consistency of the color itself that you can stretch it and yeah. fill it up. But they were asking, do you take the individual, because with some of the things that you painted, uh, do you take it around because it's so precise and clear? No, there's no taking. Before these paintings, I spent about, these paintings came after about 
eight, eight years, I think, of making hard edge paintings. And when I first started making them, um, I thought, oh, I have to tape them because everyone tapes their hard edge. But then I, I discovered that curves and complex images are actually easier to do if you just train yourself to, to cut in and do the lines straight. And is and it because of the oil that it's easier to do? Because no. I can imagine with acrylic it would be more difficult. It's actually, each of them, they each has a different technique. The oil has a different way of actually cutting to the edge to the, than the acrylic. The acrylic is pretty much like, it's, yeah. you just cut in, but the oil, you've got to urge the oil up to the edge and kind of work at the edge. So it's, it, but after a while it just becomes routine and after a period of training it's all possible. But if these were master, they would take a lot longer and um, it would be a lot harder. As well. And the, the other trick about this, this sort of thing, it's a kind of a technical trick, is that once you're trained and you can do it evenly, the slight variations become even over the whole canvas. Mm -hmm. And if you look pretty carefully, you'll see that there is an even variation in the line work that makes it look sharp. So the drawing is in paint from the beginning? Um, no, the drawings, the drawings done with um, blue pencil or oh, it is. Yeah, two, several. Actually, there are several different colour pencils in here because of yeah. the compositional arrangement. Yeah. Essentially, the compositional arrangement is um, a, dip, a, a circle or a disc on the rectangle. But the compositional arrangement also has gradation in colour um, between the shapes as well as within the shapes. So, in order to get the slight bulge, the slight changes in the, in the colour as you go across the surfaces, it's actually a matter of measuring, and, but there's also a matter of allowing um, the shapes to, de to determine a little bit how that change takes place. So you never really quite know, I don't ever really quite know how it's going to work out until I've done it. And sometimes you, know, you have to kind of adjust that a little bit as you go. So planning, you can't be just planned like a Renaissance painting. It, you have to actually just kind of adjust it a bit as you go. So the blue in the middle, for instance, that getting that to just be blue enough is actually, you know, within the black, is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Especially as the black is very transparent and tends to get very chalky <laughs> when it dries. So funny little technical things like that, you know, like you think, oh, it won't matter, you know. But when you actually come to do it, it actually getting those little tiny internal colour changes right is very tricky. And um, that, that actually is the hardest part of the painting. Um, the colour blending is actually, once you get used to it, it's quite straightforward. It's um, just a matter of being extremely rigorous with your colour blending. So, you know, you just, after a while, your hand just does it automatically. Just um, away from that technical side of it, um, I'm interested in the way you approach the light, the, the way you express light in the paintings in relation to your interpretation of the planets. Yeah. Well, the, the light is all brought, like, um, I guess it goes back to the idea of fiction. The light is actually brought into the presence of, you know, so the light in the paintings is, is actually what's receivable by the eyes. So you, the paintings actually vary, not completely within that, but they are within that range. So there are no, there's no hidden claim in the painting about what's visible and not visible. Um, I'm not really interested in making some mysterious claims that way. So the range of colours and light is only within the visible. I mean, there is a recent photograph of Mercury, which goes beyond the visible and brings the invisible into the visibility. It was in the, on the internet a couple of days ago. And there are a lot of colours that are interpreted in that, invisible colours which are interpreted as visible in Mercury. A lot of them were violets, which were brought from ultraviolet into the violet. Mm -hmm. And I'm not interested in that in the paintings. I, I don't believe in pretending that there is some invisibility there. There may well be, but I don't think it's... I think painting is concerned with um, showing how the visible is visible. <laughs> uh, and it goes against a lot of what is, is current in art, you know, showing the invisible and all that sort of stuff. But I, I think the invisible that's shown in artwork is actually beyond uh, the technical aspects of um, colour and so on. So that answer, is that something close to what you want to know? I was just interested in referring to um, the colour of the Renaissance painting as a technique, and, but also in, in subject matter. There's the idea of painting the planets and their representations as mm. physical manifestations, and yet this sort of more um, restrained, like a general scientific approach you're taking to interpret the planets, sort of bringing it into that sort of scientific tradition, which is equally as long. Mm. But how much, what well, do you think there is? 
any overlap or if you brought anything intuitively or your knowledge of those other paintings in terms of the, the personalities of Australia? Well, I think these are abstract personalities, abstract figures. They're abstract paintings in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I don't think they're... even. I, I asked Connie to play the Gustav Holst, the planets, on the, at the exhibition opening. And, you know, we've had it playing in the background. But he, his concern in the planets is, is a kind of... It's kind of spiritual in the sense that he is investigating the character of the planets within his time. And the way that spirituality relates to science at that time is quite different to the way that it relates now. Mm -hmm. And I don't see these paintings as being of that same kind as the stuff. I see them of, as being more of their time, where you know, the connections between... The, the, the early 20th century spirituality is no longer the way that people think things out. But it's, but it's still a tradition, it's still something that's driving a lot of artists now. And I think there is still something to be found in painting like this that has that connection. So in that sense, I'm just fitting into a long line of, of approaches to, to painting. I don't think you can take it away from it. No, I don't think you can. No. It's, although there is a, ever since I guess the Second World War, there's been a sort of slight embarrassment about talking about spiritual things in the painting. Um, but I don't, I don't want to sort of say, oh yes, I'm being spiritual in my painting. But I think it has an effect that inspires spirituality in people's thinking about, about the planets, for instance, when I'm doing this. And that goes back to the idea of the mystery of the person. Mm -hmm. And if people ask me, what do you mean by spirituality, I often get puzzled and I don't want to make it sound sort of quasi-religious or anything like that. So I say, well, it's like horses, <laughs> spirited horses, you know. This is about <laughs> spirited people, about, in, about people's understanding of themselves as spirited like the horses. You know, so the, the horses uh, rearing up and, and feeling their physicality. And that feeling is an ancient feeling in humanity. The Greeks called it tumos. And uh, the idea of being full of your, of your physicality has a spiritual effect. Um, I know it's dangerous, it's Achilles. Oh, and there he is. <laughs> it's dangerous and it's Achilles. And against it is pitched Odysseus, the thinking, thoughtful man with his helmet up who has an inner thought. So it is a, it is a dangerous world to, to touch, but I still think that that's the spirituality that needs to be touched in people mm -hmm. now. And I, I think guess that's actually what I was thinking about. You know, you expressed much of the picture is that you know, there's just such a long tradition of what I'm sort of trying to engage with that abstract, that elemental, mm -hmm. and, um, and the idea of that character being ascribed mm -hmm. to those planets and then being given physical yeah. form. But that but does... Way, well, that does connect me to people like Liz Lizitsky and Malevich, who attempted to reconfigure um, the idea of the icon, for instance, or various other spiritual ideas in their painting, to make something that was of their time, that was still spiritual, and something which is um, relinquished by the materialist thinking in the West, and something that then turns what was a spiritual form of art into a kind of formalism. And... Um, when I teach formalism, I always remind the students that it comes from a thinking which is about reconfiguring spirituality in the here and now. So, um, if that is possible, I'm not sure, but I still think it's a valuable thing to do um, in humanity. And you know, if that places me in a certain way in history, I'm happy, happy for that. In the 1980s, if I'm lucky. <laughs> in the 1980s, there were quite a few conferences, the spiritual and the arts, you want most like yeah. about they're quite famous and uh, these um, conferences were they consisted of uh, artists like Cage, Judd, mm. uh, particularly very very concrete and uh, reduced monochrome and mm. abstract artists. Now perhaps this, the word spiritual is um, is something that people relate to religion, yet it is not because we need to define the word spiritual because spiritual means everything what you just said before. The invisible the invisibility, the in the incorporability that you know anything that is not visible and still has an effect, like you will have an aura around you, you have to create an atmosphere which shows on your face, but it is something that comes from the inside which is not visible. So naturally Every piece of art is an outcome of a spiritual act because it is something that is made visible that is not visible, right? Mm. Yes. And with it comes a feeling to, together with that what you see, which is a visibility of someone's idea or mind, 
is a feeling that goes with it, which again is invisible, but is felt with everyone, and that's why we say it's in the eye of the beholder, whatever it gets triggered off by the person. As I would often say, um, art is in the body of the beholder, right. that uh, it's our body that the uh, art addresses. And so our invisibility is our inability to see our own body, but to see that our presence has a physical body. So I think it's important that art has to touch that somehow. This is a, um, your paintings, I basically think on gravity, but I know that gravity holds the whole cosmos together. Yeah. But it's not there. So that's another thing. Um, my knowledge and the invisibility of the paintings. Yeah. You've taken it out. I've dislocated it. Yeah. So it becomes a question of, yeah. of not of our, our weight on the ground, mm -hmm. but a question of the bits that are held together. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, I'm sort of give, giving us a moment of, away from it in order to see yeah. the broader picture. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about claiming that it's successful. I think um, it's, you know, I, I don't want to sort of sound like I'm paying too much. Um, you know, like when you, when you make a painting like this, you don't, I don't think about all those thoughts. I'm just desperately trying to get it all done, you know. So, you know, and, and sort of thinking about some of the thinking is sort of post work, some is pre work. What we know and what we see. Yeah, and what we make. Yeah. It's not, it's not all one coherent no. thing. So, yeah, it's all, some of it's reflection on, on once I've made the work. And, I have yeah. a, a very intimate uh, um, personal question. When you <laughs> were painting then, uh, no. I remember I did once say the Himalayas a cause of mandala painting, and I painted mm -hmm. the Buddha, and the Buddha is the um, construct of geometric uh, equations. Um, and then you're filling it in in a creative way. So it has, it's very, very constructive yeah. and very geometric. Yeah. When I was painting it, I got so high, I thought, oh my God. Now, is there a similar experience that you had whilst you were in the process of painting them? And was the experience different from planet to planet? I think it happened when I finished them, Connie. <laughs> 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 but during the process, it's a working process. I've got the radio on. I'm, you know, like once I set it all up, and, and I, I have to be careful not to lose concentration when I'm doing the difficult bits, but a lot of it is kind of, um, it, it's kind of meditative, but it gives me, it, part of my brain just works their way at it when I'm working it, and I have to occupy the other part. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll listen to, you know, I'll argue with the radio, this sort of thing, as Donna knows. And, uh, you know, so I'll do all that at the same time, and I, I, otherwise it just becomes, you know, I, I'd probably lose contact with the concentrating on the work. Um, I'm not sure whether it's like some kind of ecstasy or something like that. I, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. But certainly, when I finished a work, it's such a relief. It's like it's done, you know. And and I don't even quite know as I finish it um, that it is finished until I say, "Oh yes, it's finished," you know. And there's a sudden realization: yes, it's done. That's a that's a strange moment, you know, to see a painting finished like that. That would be my next question. When do you know that something is finished? I have no idea. It just happens. <laughs> and sometimes you don't quite know, and you have to kind of stop a minute and you look up. Oh yes, it's done. You know. mm -hmm. Although, there sometimes there is a once the process has gone through a few times, not in this series but in other series of paintings, where after a while the churning out of the paintings becomes, um, you, you know, it's, it's too it's far too routine. I think. And I think that's actually, I, for me, that's a bit dangerous, and it means that I'm doing too much on a particular idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I've lost the, um, the sort of uh, fleshiness of it, in a way. Um, and I know it's time to, to stop doing them and all like that, and to do something else. But, yeah, certainly that's a strange moment, finishing a painting. And I'm actually experimenting with um, uh, gestural techniques at the moment. And it's very difficult for the gestural technique to know when you're finished. And, but I think it's important to, tr to practice and train and get a feeling for it and get other people to say it's finished for you in the early stages and sort of test it off other people. Very so, dangerous. Yeah, very dangerous test. Other people will tell you the wrong yeah, thing. Often. Exactly. But you need, in the first stage, you need to make mistakes. There need to be a whole lot of stuff you throw out. Um, and then once you get a better feeling for it, then you just sort of, it just becomes your own and you just kind of get feel when it's finished. Um, and so there's a, uh, I think in the hard edge paintings that process is quite small 
It's kind of a little tiny but very intense moment. But I think with different techniques, they become longer and fuller and a little bit harder to, to manage. So anyway, that's what I'm doing now. Can I ask you a question? Um, in relation to that, basically, uh, this painting, this painting, part of that painting over there, but not that, that one, uh, working within a kind of harmonious set of areas of spectrum. Yeah. Uh, that one over there is using contrast. Yeah. From, and it's close to turning. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little about that? Because the, 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 these paintings don't have uh, obvious contrast, mm. but they have a kind of strong tonal yeah. colour. Yeah. Uh, the tonal, yeah. tonal variation that's close. Yes. Um, but, well, I wanted to make the planets that way. I wanted them to have a close tonal variation, so they're kind of, if you blur your eyes, they're a bit smoother when you look at them. They're kind of a smooth overall thing. But the hard edge gives them contrast in the middle. And I was particularly after that effect to make them a unified object. So that there is a very ambiguous relationship between the compositional elements and the overall object. Not very ambiguous, but if you look at them, stare at them for a while, you get depth in that circular part. And then you see this depth around them, so they, whether what they actually are as a representation is quite ambiguous I mean, with a long looking. And I, was, I knew that those particular, that way of approaching tonal variation would do that. And that was just from you know, long practice. But the other ones were about a particular form that I wanted to show in the painting, so I needed to get contrast between two different kinds of, two different sets of uh, colours and variations in colours. So, um, yeah, so it was, a, and, and the other ones were painted in acrylic, so it's much easier to, to actually uh, set out all the colours beforehand, whereas the oils are all done as you go. So these are all mixed on the, on the palette as you go. So, uh, you re with the planets, the technical control of the colour is much more difficult than it is with the other ones. Virginia. Uh, very incoherent comments all. Um, I just wanted to go back to what you were saying at the beginning about the person in front of the painting. Mm. Um, I've been staring at this one all the time. And the whole issue of our physical body in front of the thing. Mm. One, I'm fascinated by how you can put into an absolute rectangle that can be expanded. It was an extraordinary experience of, of just going, expanding into whatever it is. This sense of, we talk about the spiritual, I think there's, there's often this sense of, that a painting can, if you stand there and we are physically standing on the ground mm. and yet we escape gravity. Yeah. Here. It doubles us, really, doesn't it? It's, um, and it's in that loss of the softness, the, the ideas, the this is, the that, um, that allows that sort of curious break mm. into what we might call spirituality. I don't even have another word for it because yeah, it's there's so shock and one. Yeah, mm. right. um, but it, this sense of escape into this extraordinary space. And I, I'm astonished by um, the way you know, you're standing, you're using your gravity, and, you, and yet and it's quite clear that the painting has a base that you know you might like to take the additional sense of it being grounded. Uh, but it's not. It's, it's a wonderful achievement, I think. <laughs> but it reminded me of something that I had meant to say about um, the double image mm. and the double effect of the image. I just want to say one other thing. Ever since, I'm really, really, and I've never got to the bottom of it, I can't see flat painting. To see, it, to see something flat is not to see it as a painting. And I think every painter has to see their painting as not a painting at some stage in the process. But the doubling of images is a very old idea, you know, the surface and the depth in the image. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when you talk when I was taught drawing as a child, we taught to see foreshortening by seeing the surface at the same time as seeing the depth. Mm -hmm. So we have to see it as doubled. Yeah. Um, uh, it's very difficult, to, you know, it's not an easy thing to do and, and but it with practice it can be learned. So, it's, and I think that, that theme runs all the way through all of Western art, really, the idea of the double image, yeah. um, depth and surface, you know, the caves in Lascaux, you know, the, it's, a, it's about a, a depth that those drawings and those paintings exist in. And 
you know, I, d- I d- don't even think about it when I'm doing it. I always think about the differences. Mm. Like Bridget Riley, you know, talking about the speed in her painting. It's the speed between the, pan- the different colours. Yeah. She talks about the speed that it takes to get from there to there. So, you know, I think it's actually one of the common things, and it has nothing to do with figuration. It has to do with space. How carefully do you plan or do you preparatory drawing studies? Yeah, I do lots of drawings. The, making the actual drawings and the curves for the planets, that takes a lot of sketching and trying to get the curves right and then try, then figuring out what part will be stencils and what are not. You know, whether I just what parts I actually just draw on the canvas. And there are some shapes that really flow off the hand really easily. And some shapes you have to make stencils because they, will, they just don't follow the hand properly. So uh, there's a lot of preparatory drawings. All of these paintings have, I don't know if I have still have them, but they have a colour test. So even though I mix them all by hand on the, on the palette, I'll, I'll run through all where the colour's going in the first place, and I'll work out whether how how grey, how you know the tonal changes, and I think well that's about where I want to go, and I sort of mark it out on a piece of canvas and just sort of smear them with a palette knife, and so I'll do that before I even start, and then I'm looking at the colour palette going, oh, I missed that one, <laughs> I have to go back and. And maybe I got it wrong in the first place or something like that, you know, so I have to adjust it. So it's quite a lot of hoo-ha at the beginning. And which direction do you work? I mean, do you... I don't work in the direction. No, yeah. work, well, actually, I work in the direction of the composition, not, not in terms of the canvas. So mm. what I'll do is I'll set up the uh, whole canvas with a, with a compositional circle on it, and then I'll start working in the shapes and everything and working out how complex and how, where they've got to go. I cheat a little bit in that I try to get big, certain big areas in certain parts of the composition without letting the thing just become, you know, sort of auto-drawing. auto, auto drawing. Mm. Um, And uh, then I start with where... I'll, I'll start with either the lightest or the darkest colour and work towards the other side. But I tend to do the gra- gradated, graduated colours first. So, and then I'll look for the lightest to the most coloured part and work that way. And sometimes there are dark parts which have to be put in so that I can see where the light bits are going. So I might put those in beforehand. So it's quite a, there's no particular rule about where I start. You know, it's just to think, well, I've got to start with the light bits, I'll put those there. I've got to start with the dark bits, I'll put those there. It's, it's sort of setting your range. Yeah. But yeah. after a little study that tells you what it's going to look like when yeah. it finishes. Yeah, some, I do gouache studies. The, yeah. gouache, the gouache studies are in colour, but they're not the final colour. They just to tell me which directions I've got to go in with the changes in colour. So they're kind of colour models rather than re- representing the final colour. And often they don't look anything like, they're completely different colours to the final, final works. But I just know, they just give me a clue and remind me. So there's quite a lot of fitting and carrying on at the beginning. But actually starting the canvas is quite interesting. You know, the first mark you put on the canvas, I'll stand there for a while and sort of, you know, sort of stroke the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really want me? To <laughs> Excuse me, madam. You know. <laughs> there is there's something about that. I mean, all painters know this. That the, you know, the smell of the paint, the smell of the canvas, is all very sort of. You know, so that's a very uh, for me. That's very important in painting. Is all the the tactility, the, the physicality of the actual materials, and I, find, I still find all that very attractive. You know, quite luscious. So, yeah. And the destruction of the wall. The destruction of the white hair. Yeah. The, the first time, that's why I like to start with the white, so the destruction starts with very small. <laughs> Although I was told as a child, always put the black in first with your painting, you know. But, and, you know, when, we, when I was taught to, to construct a painting, it was to um, do your grounds and then your drawing, you know, underpainting and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I don't really follow that that closely. I mean, I do some underpainting, but not much. It is interesting though watching them come to life. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I'll see a painting when it's um, about halfway through, and for instance, that painting, and it might be that all of the greys are in. And, and I'll think, where on the where, What's that going? going? And Tom will say, no, you, you just can't see it, it's going to be like this. It's in his head, you can actually see it. Yeah. And then when you see it at the end, you go, <laughs> That's an yeah, illusion that I can see it. They work on two or three at the same time. Uh, no, only one of the with the planets, only one at a time. Some of the later paintings, I work the smaller ones. I work on two of them at the same time, but um, mostly one at a time. But I would love to be able to work on two at a time. But first of all, I don't have the space to do that, 
but secondly, um, when you're working on, with so many different colours, it's very difficult to keep your concentration on what you're doing. So one at a time for this kind of work, I think. Do you keep the little tin? Enough with so the acrylics, yeah. That? Well, yeah. with the acrylics, I do. I have all of the colour sets all still still sitting in the But um, oil paints, I don't keep anything except for the testers. No. Um, this, I mean, what, what can you keep, really? I remember those, someone, those old little old round tobacco tins, you know, they really seal. Yeah, they still do it. Yeah. Well, the best thing for storing acrylics are little plastic uh, uh, bottling food, uh, food jars, and they're complete. They're not. They're not semi-permeable membranes. They're actually completely sealed off, and they, they keep the acrylics wet. But just about any other con plastic container is a semi-permeable membrane that will sort of leak. So at you know, molecular at a molecular level. Um, but oil paints. They, you can, once, once you've mixed it, it goes off. It, it will go off in a certain amount of time. So you can, you can keep it for about a day, I think. After that, it's that you get the skin and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. One more black in that paint. It's just a real black. It's not entirely black. It's got a little bit of blue in it. And you know, we can see that the blue appears in the middle. I started the blue at the edge, so it slowly becomes bluer. Yeah. And blue and black are very difficult to see, but if you put a brown, you just put it against the brown. <laughs> you can see it. But, so, yeah. yeah, it has a tonal density. Uh, tonal density in black is very difficult to get. So, yeah, it often looks a bit streaky, and uh, it's because of the transparent quality of the paint immediately shows through. Um, when, usually when painting black, I'll, put, I'll do a, a dark coloured underpainting and it will be the colour that I want it to appear. So a blue under a black is a good one. Anyway, I, I, was, I, taught, I was taught painting in the 60s by a sort of European refugee. And um, anyway, he taught me all those tricks with painting. And, and so mm -hmm. it's quite so interesting. who was that, yeah. hmm? Who was that? That was Vladislav Dudkevich. Oh, did you? Vlad Dudkevich, and he, mm -hmm. he taught me a lot of uh, stuff about painting. He taught me how to roll the, unroll the bottom of the painting tube and squeeze out the last bit. Yeah, um, yeah. How to how to use uh, solvents and things like that, and how to, what colours don't go with what <laughs> other colours, what not to put under, you know, fat over lean, all that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. He said it's important to know those things, you, mm. no matter what you do. Yeah, and drawing too, you know, that, that sort of modernist style of drawing which I, I've done. He was taught by Kandinsky, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God, so. yeah, it's degrees of separation is mm -hmm. scary. <laughs>
So this is happening in the universe as a matter of fact, right? And the universe will give you a uh, epileptic fit. That <laughs> 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 <Right> as well. <laughs> yeah. And I discovered that the other day at his studio. I said, no, this has to come into the show. And, <laughs> and we found that this is actually quite... Um, it's grounding. It pulls it all together. It, it's a funny thing because the universe is black, major, majorly. And there is this uh, dark matter that makes things disappear like and uh, reflected on, on the earth. The same thing, materialistic attitude is like dark matter and just dissolves the goodness in people. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Tom. That was very lovely. And thank you, everyone. It was very fantastic questions and a great audience. Thank you so much. Chocolates. Yeah. 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 Yeah.